Good evening. How's everybody doing? Great to be learning with you on a Tuesday. Yom Shlishi. Let's light up the darkness. I'm switching brain <laughs> from what I was doing all day long, visual, inspecting the movie, making it come alive as we do the color grading on our film. It's so exciting watching it all come together. Uh, and now switching over to analytical. It's, I'm so happy to be here, but it's definitely a switch. Who's in the house? Joe in the Inland Empire, Shandor in the Bronx, Paul in the Great Northwest, Nancy, North Carolina, Guy in Ohio, Joseph in Massachusetts, Bell in Florida, Bill in Mid-Missouri, Lucy in Minnesota, Frank in San Pedro, Ella in the house. Welcome, everybody. Our DAF today, slightly longer than recent pages have been. We are, uh, it's 27, DAF Chaf Zion, Mishnah, and we're going to start with Mishnah number six here in chapter two. Generally speaking, the laws of re finding and returning lost objects. And this Mishnah number six. You know, again, they never approach questions in the simply, you know, let's set up the laws. What are the basic laws? And then get into from simple cases to complicated cases. The sages always dump you right in the complicated case. And then later they reveal the kind of basic laws that they've been taking for granted that you already know them. So here we're getting a little bit down to the basics of how we know uh, the importance of distinguishing marks uh, when we find an object and we're going to decide, you know, is this something that the uh, person who lost it has despaired of ever recovering because there's really no way to get it back to them because it's not distinct, right? So scattered coins in the street, nobody would expect to recover that because there's no way to know whose coins they are. But when we talk about distinguishing marks, is this something that's actually spelled out in the Torah? Yes, sort of. <laughs> and so here we go. Let's get into it. Mishnah number six on page 27. We're in chapter two of Tractate Bava Mitzia, the 22nd volume of the Talmud. Mishnah six. This Mishnah is an excerpt from a halachic midrash concerning lost items based on the verse, Deuteronomy 22, verses one through three, you shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep wandering and disregard them. You shall return them to your brother, right? So if you see a lost object <coughs> that belongs to your brother, meaning your fellow Jew, you can't walk by it and let somebody else deal with it. You're obligated to pick it up uh, and try to get this thing back safely to the person who lost it. And so shall you do with his donkey, and so shall you do with his garment, and so shall you do with every lost item of your brother. And right away, we've been doing this together for a long time, right? So the, the brain should be saying, well, so shall you do for every lost item. So why did the Torah, right? Why did God, telling Moses what to write, specify donkey and garment. Now that you've already said every lost item, why does it also list two specific items, donkey and garment? And of course, we're going to learn out laws from that. So the pasuk, the verse continues, and so shall you do with his donkey, so shall you do with his garment, and so shall you do with every lost item of your brother, which shall be lost from him, and you have found it. You may not disregard it. Now it said you may not disregard it twice. It said that it was lost twice, right? So whenever we have these multiple uh, statings of the same thing, repetition, it means that it was repeated with a slight variation, but to teach you additional laws. So that was the verse in the Torah. Now says the Mishnah, the garment was also included in the generalization that one must return all these items. And why did it emerge from the generalization uh, that it should be specified, right? Why is it that the garment is specified when it already said all or, you know, any lost item or every lost item, right? What was it? 
uh, with every lost item. So why did God specify the garment? Says the Mishnah, to draw an analogy to it and say to you, what is notable about a garment? It is notable in that there are distinguishing marks concerning it, and it has claimants asserting ownership, and its finder is obligated to proclaim his fine. Right? Remember, every garment in ancient times was handmade. Right? There's no such thing uh, as uh, you know off the rack mass production. So every garment was unique, right? So when we hear about a garment, we say, ah, it's not things that are like coins, which are minted and every coin is the same because every garment was unique. And so too, with regard to any item concerning which there are distinguishing marks and it has claimants, right? So things that are have distinguishing marks that they, you can say this is a unique item and it must belong to somebody and they can say what about it is distinguished, right? They can point to it and say, my garment has a fleck of blue here and a red stripe there and a hole there and an irregular seam here, etc. And that it has claimants, right? Meaning that multiple people could come or, or that we're waiting for people to come and say it is theirs as opposed to something that no one's going to come and say it is theirs because the person certainly despaired of recovering it, right? That it has claimants is the opposite of the owner surely despaired of recovering it. Uh, so about this, the finder is obligated to proclaim his find. If he finds this kind of an item that has distinguishing marks and claimants, then he is obligated to proclaim, to announce, I found an object. So he would just say, I found a garment, for example. If somebody lost a garment, let him come forward and describe what it is that he lost, and then he can get it back if it's indeed his. And so too, with regard to any item concerning which there are distinguishing marks and it has claimants asserting ownership, its finder is obligated to proclaim his fine. Right? That's how we, what we learn out from the garment. The garment is one with distinguishing marks and somebody will come forward and wouldn't have despaired of losing it. And so too, anything that shares those qualities, distinguishing marks and claimants who can come forward, uh, then the, the one who finds it can't keep it. It is not finders keepers. He must proclaim his fine. That's the Mishnah. Now the Gemara. When the Mishnah says that the garment was included in the generalization that one must return all of these items, in what generalization was it included? And Rava said, it is included in the generalization, and so shall you do with his donkey, and so shall you do with his garment, and so shall you do with every lost item of your brother, which shall be lost from him, and you have found it, you may not disregard it. That's the generalization. So Rava says, why do I need all the specific items that the merciful one writes that one must return? An ox, a donkey, a sheep, and a garment. One of them would seem to suffice. <clears throat> And Rava answers, they are all necessary, as a unique law is derived from each example. As if the merciful one had written only garment, I would say, this matter, i.e. the commandment to return a lost item, applies only in a case where the owner brings witnesses capable of testifying about the item itself. Yes, here's a witness that can say that garment belongs to Sal. And if I can't bring a witness, then I don't get it back. Distinguishing marks is, takes the place of bringing a witness, right? Uh, <clears throat> so you might have thought that without, you know, without the, if these items were not included, you might have thought that a person can only recover his lost item if he brings witnesses. Uh, or if he describes distinguishing marks concerning the item itself, but with regard to returning a donkey to its owner in a case where he brings witnesses with regard to the saddle or describes distinguishing marks concerning the saddle and not on the donkey, say that we would not return the donkey to the owner. And to counter this, the merciful one writes, donkey, from which it is derived that a donkey is returned to its owner even in a case where he describes distinguishing marks of the saddle. Right. Very interesting. Right. You, you, maybe the guy doesn't remember what his donkey looks like because uh, he only got it a short time ago. 
but he remembers his saddle because he interacted with the saddle more than with the donkey. You know, whatever. Maybe he doesn't have a, a face, a, a name. He doesn't have a, a memory for remembering faces of donkeys that he can remember the saddle. So it's good enough to remember the distinguishing marks of the saddle, and that's a way to reclaim the donkey. Rava continues with regard to the specific mention of ox and sheep that the merciful one writes. Why do I need them? It wasn't enough to say any every lost item. And then I also added garment and donkey. Why are we now also adding ox and sheep? What are we going to learn out from that? Rava answers, from ox, it is derived that one must return even the sheared wool of its tail. Right? That's a very inexpensive item. And from sheep, it is derived that one must return even its sheared wool. And the Gemara challenges, and let the merciful one write only ox, from which it is derived that one must return even the sheared wool of its tail, and derive all the more so that one must return the more substantial sheared wool of a sheep. So rather, Rava said the term donkey stated with regard to damage in the category of pit that we learned in Tractate Bavakama, uh, according to the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, that was on Bavakama 54a, and the term sheep stated with regard to a lost item, according to the opinion of everyone, are difficult, and there is no explanation for why they are stated. So the Gemara suggests and say that the term sheep comes to teach the obligation to return the animal's dung. And the Gemara answers, one need not return dung because the owner has renounced its ownership. He left it lying in the street. Uh, So the Gemara suggests, and perhaps the term sheep comes to teach the obligation to return an item based on its owner providing distinguishing marks. As we raise the dilemma, is the law that an item can be identified using distinguishing marks by Torah law or is it by rabbinic law? So therefore, the merciful one writes, sheep in order to teach that it is not only through the testimony of witnesses, but even based on distinguishing marks, that we return lost items to their owner. So resolve the dilemma and conclude that the law that an item can be identified using distinguishing marks, as opposed to having witnesses come forward, which is the way that we establish all monetary matters. You need witnesses. Here, you don't have to bring a witness to say that, yeah, that is Sal's donkey. If Sal can say, well, before looking at it, right, somebody announced, I found a donkey, and I step forward, I say, well, my donkey that I lost has a black spot right behind its eye and a brown spot, you know, right beside its leg and has a little scar by the tail. Those would be distinguishing marks. Then I don't need to bring witnesses. Since I'm establishing ownership, that's a monetary matter, and not by witnesses, and I'm able to do it with distinguishing marks, it must be that identification through distinguishing marks is by Torah law rather than by rabbinic law. Now, why does it matter whether it's Torah law or rabbinic law? As we'll see, for monetary matters, uh, we can establish things by rabbinic law. But for matters of ritual importance, like whether a woman was divorced or not, Uh, then the standard is higher. It's by Torah law. And so you wouldn't, you know, whereas you might allow, you know, somebody to remarry, uh, where you might allow somebody to, you know, cough up a lost item or, you know, get out of a contract to build a a house uh, with a lower standard of evidence. When it comes to dissolving a marriage, you have to have a very high standard of evidence uh, because if you make a mistake and she's not divorced when she thinks she is and then she goes and remarries and that second marriage is not married is not valid and she has kids with the second husband and it's not really her husband those kids become momsers it's a disaster right so this difference between rabbinic law and Torah law in this realm very important <clears throat> so this I and, and, and you'll see we're going to talk more about this. So this question of, is identification through distinguishing marks by Torah law or rabbinic law? We're going to keep coming back to that. Uh, Now, the Gemara rejects this proof. The sages say, one can understand the matter from the fact that the Tan of our Mishnah teaches the concept of distinguishing marks together with the term garment. As it is taught in the Mishnah, what is notable about a garment? It is notable in that there are distinguishing marks concerning it. And it has claimants asserting ownership, because the person who lost a garment doesn't despair of recovering it, usually. And therefore, the finder is obligated to proclaim his find. So too, with regard to any item 
concerning which there are distinguishing marks and it has claimants asserting ownership. Its finder is obligated to proclaim his find, try to find the owner. Now, conclude from it that the term sheep does not come to teach the obligation to return an item based on its owner providing distinguishing marks. If so, then why was the term sheep included in this verse? The sage is taught in a Baraisa. The verse states, and so shall you do with his donkey, and so shall you do with his garment, and so shall you do with every lost item of your brother, which shall be lost from him, and you have found it. So the rabbis derive that this phrase serves to exclude a lost item in which there is not the value of one peruta, uh, I'm sorry. I just want to double check something. Uh, right, and so just just reminding you that ox and sheep were mentioned at the beginning of this verse. We keep talking about garment and donkey, but at the beginning it said, "You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep." Right. So let's keep going. Uh, right. Uh, Right, so the sage is taught in a Baraisa. The verse states, and so shall you do with his donkey, and so shall you do with his garment, and so shall you do with every lost item of your brother, which shall be lost from him, and you have found it. So the rabbis derive that this phrase serves to exclude a lost item in which there is not the value of one peruta. It's such a small, worthless item, then there's not going to be claimants for it because no one cares that they lost something worth less than a penny. Uh, and Rabbi Yehuda says that this law is derived from the conclusion of that verse, which shall be lost from him, and you have found it. And the term, and you have found it, that serves to exclude a lost item in which there is not the value of one peruta, right? So the, the idea that we only have to deal with finding the owner of an item if it's worth a penny or more, uh, you have... You have uh, the sages, the majority, learning that out from the, from the phrase, which shall be lost. And Rabbi Yehuda learns it out from, and you have found it. So what difference does it make which of the words in this verse the sages use to learn the same law that Rabbi Yehuda is learning? Right? They're learning it out from different source in the verse. What difference does it make which words in the verse they choose to learn the same law that you only have to proclaim if you found, you know, seek the owner of something worth a penny or more. So the Gemara asks, what is the practical difference between the two opinions? Ostensibly, the rabbis and Rabbi Yehuda both state the same law. So Abaye said there is no practical difference. Rather, the interpretation of the meaning of the verse is the difference between them. One sage, meaning the rabbis, derives it from the phrase, which shall be lost. And the other sage, meaning Rabbi Yehuda, <coughs> derives it from the term, and you have found it. And according to the first sage, meaning the rabbis, who derives the law that one need not return a lost item, I'm sorry, and according to the first sage, the rabbis, who derive the halacha, the law that one need not return a lost item worth less than a penny, a peruta, from the phrase, which shall be lost, what does he do with the other phrase, and you have found it? And the Gemara answers, according to the rabbis, that term is necessary for the derivation of the law in accordance with the opinion of Rabbinai. As Rabbinai says, in interpreting the verse, and so shall you do with every lost item of your brothers, which he has lost, and you have found it, that the term, and you have found it, means that it assumes the status of a found item only when it actually enters his possession. And so now we go to the other side. According to Rabbi Yehuda, who derives the law that one need not return a lost item worth less than one peruta from the term, and you have found it, what does he do with the phrase, which has been lost from him? And so the Gemara answers, according to Rabbi Yehuda, that phrase is necessary for the derivation of the law in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yochanan. As Rabbi Yochanan says in the name of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, from where is it derived with regard to a lost item that the river swept away, that it is permitted for its finder to keep it? It is derived from this verse, as it is written, and so shall you do with his donkey, and so shall you do with his garment, and so shall you do with every lost item of your brother, which shall be lost from him, and you have found it. And the verse states that one must return that which is lost from him, the owner, but that is available to be found by any person. And this excludes that which is lost from him and is not available to be found by any person. It is ownerless property and anyone who finds it may keep it. 
That's the case when the river sweeps away the property and anybody would despair of recovering it. It's not available for anyone to find. It's just been swept away. Maybe it'll turn up on a bank, maybe not. In most cases, it'll just get swept out to sea. So if it happens to end up on the bank, then whoever finds it can keep it, as opposed to somebody who drops something in a place where it's much more easily found and accessible. The Gemara asks, in the other Tana, Rabbi Yehuda, who derived from the term, and you have found it, that one need not return an item worth less than one peruta, uh, from where does he derive the law of Rabbani that the item assumes the status of a found item only when it actually comes into his possession? And the Gemara answers, Rabbi Yehuda derives it from the superfluous conjunction and in the term, and you have found it. So the Gemara asks further, and so the first Tana, who derives from the phrase, which shall be lost from him, that one need not return an item that is worth less than one peruta, from where does he derive the law of Rabbi Yochanan, that one need not return an item that is lost from him and not available to be found by every person, like if it was swept away by the river? So the Gemara answers, he derives that law from the superfluous term, from him, in the phrase, which shall be lost from him, And as for, because we know it's from the guy who lost it when we say which was lost, right? So adding from him once again in the verse is superfluous and therefore available for interpretation. And as for the other uh, sage in this uh, debate, Rabbi Yehuda, he does not learn anything from the superfluous term from him. He just leaves it alone. So Abaye explained that there is no practical difference between the opinion of the sages and Rabbi Yehuda. By contrast, Rava said the practical difference between them is with regard to an item that was worth one peruta when it was lost, but that was then devalued and was worth less than one peruta when it was found. So according to the one who says, who says the law that one need not return a lost item worth less than one peruta is derived from the phrase, which shall be lost from him, there is an obligation to return the item as the verse is referring to the value of the item at the time that it was lost. So even though it later became worth less than one peruta, the guy who finds it still has to make the effort to return it because when its original owner lost it, it was worth one peruta or more. And according to the one who says the law that one need not return a lost item worth less than one peruta, that this is derived from the phrase, and you have found it, there is no obligation to return the item, as that verse is referring to the value of the item when it was found. And now you see why the timing of when something is considered a found item matters, right? Is it a found item when it comes actually into his possession, as opposed to when he saw it, or as opposed to when it was dropped, right? And because its value can change from one moment in time to another and could drop below the minimum value that triggers the obligation to go and find the owner, uh, when it becomes a a found item matters. So the Gemara asks, But even according to the one who says that the law is derived from the phrase, which shall be lost from him, do we not require the item to be worth one peruta when it is found, based on the term, and you have found it? And in this case, it is not worth one peruta when it is found, so he should agree that it need not be returned. So rather, the practical difference between them is with regard to an item worth less than one peruta when it was lost, that appreciated in value, and is worth one peruta when it is found. So according to the one who says that the law that one need not return a lost item worth less than one proof is derived from the term and you have found it, there is an obligation to return the item as that verse is referring to its value when the item is found. And according to the one who says that the law that one need not return a lost item worth less than one peruta is derived from the phrase which shall be lost from him, the one who lost it, there is no obligation to return the item as that verse is referring to the value of the item when it was lost. And the Gemara asks, whoa, wait a minute, but even according to the one who says that the law is derived from the term and you have found it, do we not require the item to be worth one peruta when it is lost based on the phrase, which shall be lost from him? And in this case, it is not worth one peruta when it was lost. So that sage should agree that it need not be returned. Rather, the practical difference of where we derive this law that we only return objects that are worth one peruta or more, right? And we're saying, do we derive that law from the phrase when it was lost or the phrase he has found, 
right? And both of these phrases are stated, are, are redundant, because we already said earlier in the verse uh, that it was lost and one must return it. Uh, so now this extra use is where they're going to learn out this minimum value requirement. And we're trying to figure out what difference does it make whether you learn out this law from the phrase, of this, you know, the, the second repetition of it was lost or from the second repetition of he found Right. So here, the practical difference between them is with regard to the case of an item that was worth one peruta when it was lost and that appreciated in value and was devalued in the interim and was worth less than one peruta and then appreciated in value and it is worth one peruta when it is found. So it was worth one peruta when it was lost and it was worth one peruta when it was found. But in between, its market value went below one peruta. What difference does that make? According to the one who says that the law, one need not return a lost item worth less than one peruta, is derived from the phrase, which shall be lost from him, there is an obligation to return the item, as the verse is referring to its value only when it was lost and when it is found. And according to the one who says that the law, that one need not return a lost item worth less than one peruta, is derived from, and you have found it, there is no obligation to return the item, as we require that there will be value of one peruta, the requisite measure of a lost item from the time of its loss until the time of its finding as the conjunction and connects the time of the finding to the time of the loss. Since that you could base this law, the deriv- derivation of this law on the second phrase, which is introduced with the word and, actually the preposition vav, but that means and, uh, so that means that it had to have that v- minimum value from the time it was lost until it was found. Since its value dropped in the meantime, you don't have, you're not obligated to return it. This is highly technical, obviously, but they are really drilling in and trying to understand what is the practical difference of where you derive that law from. <clears throat> A dilemma was raised before the sages. Is identification of an item on the basis of distinguishing marks by Torah law or is it by rabbinic law? Now, this is a much more significant question. The Gemara asks, what difference is there whether it is by Torah law or by rabbinic law? Now we're on 27b. And the Gemara answers, the practical difference is with regard to returning the get, the bill of divorce of a woman that was lost by an agent before it was delivered to her on the basis of distinguishing marks. If you say that the identification of an item on the basis of distinguishing marks is by Torah law, then we return the document and allow the agent to transmit it to the woman on behalf of her husband, and when he gives it to her, she becomes divorced. But if you say that the law of returning a lost item according to distinguishing marks, is by rabbinic law, then we do not return the document. Because when the sages institute an ordinance, which is to say create a rabbinic law, it is only with regard to monetary matters that they have the authority to declare property ownerless. But with regard to ritual matters, the sages do not institute an ordinance. They lack the authority to abrogate the prohibitions by Torah law that are associated with a woman's marital status. Because when she's married to when a woman marries a man, she becomes prohibited to every other man in the world. She is only permitted to her husband. That's what marriage means. When they divorce, she becomes prohibited to him unless they remarry. Uh, and now, <clears throat> well, let's put it this way. If, she, if he's a Cohen, she will become prohibited to him. If he's not a Cohen, she becomes permitted to every man in the world. She's a Jewish woman, so she becomes permitted to every Jewish man, meaning she can marry any Jewish man that she's permitted to marry. She can't go have sex with anybody. You can only have sex within marriage, but she's, uh, she is permitted to marry any man, right? So that happened when she became divorced. That, that is by Torah law. If we allow a uh, divorce to happen according to rabbinic law, it may be that the divorce is valid by rabbinic law but not valid by Torah law, and that would create the situation I said earlier uh, that she would think she's divorced when she's really not, 
she would remarry, have a child in the, with the second man, and that child would actually be a momzer who is prohibited from marrying anyone except another momzer. It'd be a disaster. So that's why the sages don't create ordinances like saying you can return a get, right, a bill of divorce based on distinguishing marks unless identification by distinguishing marks and returning an object by distinguishing marks is not by rabbinic ordinance, but is actually by Torah law. If it's by Torah law, then sure, you can return that lost get to the agent and the agent can deliver it to the woman and she can become divorced by it and no one can question that divorce. <clears throat> so the Gemara suggests, so that's why it's so important. Is it by Torah law or is it by rabbinic law that we return a lost object according to distinguishing marks. Remember, normally we would only establish a matter by the testimony of witnesses. So this is a way to establish ownership of an object without the testimony of witnesses, but rather by the owner himself saying, well, the thing that I owned had the following marks. And based on that, we're gonna return it. No problem if we're just returning lost property. Big challenge if we're returning a get. So that's why we need to know is identification by distinguishing marks by Torah law or by rabbinic law. So the Gemara suggests, come in here a proof from the Mishnah. The garment that was included in our verse was also included in the generalization that one must return all these lost items. And why did it emerge from the generalization that it should be specified? This is to draw an analogy to it and to say to you, what is notable about a garment? It is notable in that there are distinguishing marks concerning it, and it has claimants asserting ownership, and its finder is obligated to proclaim his fine. And so too with regard to any item concerning which there are distinguishing marks, and it has claimants asserting ownership, that its finder is obligated to proclaim his fine. So clearly, the identification of an item on the basis of distinguishing marks is by Torah law. And so you could return that lost get to the agent who was delivering it and he could go ahead and deliver it to the woman. But the Gemara rejects this proof. Perhaps it was necessary for the Tana of our Mishnah to mention only the criterion of claimants and the Tana cited the criterion of distinguishing marks for no reason. As by Torah law, distinguishing marks is not the relevant factor. And the Gemara suggests come in here a proof of this view from the aforementioned statement. The obligation to return a donkey to its owner on the basis of the distinguishing marks of the saddle is derived based on the mention of the word donkey in the verse from Deuteronomy. Clearly, the identification of an item on the basis of distinguishing marks is by Torah law. But the Gemara rejects that. In men the Barisan say there is an obligation to return the donkey only on the basis of witnesses who testify with regard to the identity of the owner based on the fact that they saw that this saddle belongs to him and not on the basis of distinguishing marks. In other words, the town of our Mishnah is saying that what is notable about a garment and why it was included in the, in the verse about returning lost objects uh, and likewise the, the donkey is because it has distinguishing marks, right? The rabbi of the Mishnah has identified that what is notable about the donkey and the, and the garment is that they have distinguishing marks and that people will come home forward to claim it and therefore the finder must proclaim his fine. But the Torah didn't say anything about distinguishing marks. So maybe the Tana made the wrong inference from the verse. That's what the Gemara is challenging. So the Gemara suggests come in here a different proof from Mishnah on page 28b that we will come to tomorrow. And if your brother be not near you and you know him not, then you shall bring it into your house and it shall be with you until your brother claims it and you shall return it to him. Now the, the, so the Torah does specify, right, this idea uh, that, you know, you found something that belongs to your brother, meaning your fellow Jew, but he doesn't live nearby. And you don't know who it belongs to. So what do you do with the object? You can't take it to him because you don't know who the owner is. You just know that a Jew dropped it because, let's say, it was dropped in a place that is frequented exclusively or by a majority of Jews. Uh, so then you shall bring it into your house and it shall be with you until your brother claims it and you shall return it to him. Now, who is going to come and claim it and you're going to give it to him? Does the first guy who walks in the door and says, hey, did you find anything? It's mine. 
Obviously not. You have no, that's not enough evidence for him to claim the lost object. Would it enter your mind that he would give the lost item to somebody before he claims it? How can the finder return it if he does not know the identity of the owner? So rather the verb derosh, right? That, that when your brother claims it, the verb for that is derosh. The verb derosh is not referring to the claim of the owner. It is referring to the scrutiny performed by the finder. Darshihu, darshehu, scrutinize him to determine whether the claimant is a swindler or whether he is not a swindler. Only then may you return the lost item to him. Right? Once you find this lost object and you proclaim that you found a lost garment, very general. You say, I found the lost garment. I found the garment. I found a donkey. Now, and you don't know who it belongs to. It doesn't have a name tag. So you proclaim that you found this thing. Now, people may come and say, well, I lost a donkey, and I lost a donkey, and I lost a donkey. Okay, well, what donkey did you lose? Or what garment did you lose? Now, these people will describe what it is that they lost. And the finder is now in the position of a detective, of an interrogator who asks questions and who has to make sure that the guy who comes forward to claim the lost item is indeed the owner, right? You are now in the position of the caretaker and the distributor, so to speak, of the lost item, right? You have to make sure that the person you hand it over to is in fact the owner. That becomes part of your responsibility as a finder. You can see why you'd be tempted to just walk past the lost object. But the Torah obligates you to pick it up and make every effort to return it to the right owner, not just to an owner, but to the true owner. And so you now need to interrogate, investigate, and make sure that when you return it to the owner, it's the real owner. The Gemara states it's suggested proof. What? Is it not that the one who claims the lost item proves that he is not a swindler on the basis of distinguishing marks? Apparently, the identification of an item on the basis of distinguishing marks must be by Torah law. But the Gemara says, no, you can't say that. No. The determination of whether he is a swindler is, could be on the basis of scrutinizing his witnesses. It's not just that he describes uh, what the thing looked like. He has to bring witnesses who say, we know this guy. He used to own, he owned this object. The object looks like this. If you have that object, please give it to him. That's not distinguishing marks. That's bringing witnesses. So we don't know yet if providing distinguishing marks is by rabbinic law or by Torah law. So the Gemara suggests, come and hear a proof from a Mishnah and tract at Yavamos 120a. One testifies that a man died, thereby permitting his wife to remarry, only if he can testify about seeing the face of the... The countenance of the face with the nose, as this allows one to identify the individual with certainty. Although there are distinguishing marks on his body and on his garments, which appear to indicate his identity, they cannot be used to identify the person, right? This man went off to war and he died. He never came back. So the wife needs evidence that her husband is dead uh, so that she can that she, you know so that she can confirm that she's a widow and that she can remarry because if it turns out that she's not a widow and she remarried disaster so what is evidence that's good enough now normally two witnesses have to come forward and say we saw your husband fall in battle or we saw your husband get hit by a car got from you know whatever it was now if it they're going to have to testify exactly what they saw Now, what if it wasn't that they were standing with her husband, whom they knew by name, they were chatting, and then a car came and hit him? What if it wasn't like that? What if they didn't even know the guy? But they happened to be walking down the street, they heard a crash, they came over, they saw a dead body, uh, and then they saw what? They saw his face? They recognized his face? Maybe they saw distinguishing marks on his face, on his body? Maybe he had some kind of markings on his skin? And they're going to come back and say, this is what we saw. Now, is that testimony going to be enough to say she can remarry? 
Now we're getting into the nitty gritty of exactly what is distinguishing marks and what is recognition. It's a little different, right? Uh, so now the Gemara states its proof. Conclude from this, right? So these people saw the face and they needed to be able to see the face and not just some markings on the body. So conclude from it that the identification of an item on the basis of distinguishing marks is not by Torah law. The sages say in rejecting this proof, the distinguishing marks on his body, right? Because it's not enough to see marks on his body. It needed to see his face and recognize it. So therefore now the Gemara is saying, so distinguishing marks is not by Torah law. And that's why she can't remarry based simply on testimony about distinguishing marks. That's to be recognition of the face. Uh, so therefore, distinguishing marks is not by Torah law. But now the Gemara is going to reject that proof. The sages say in rejecting that proof, the distinguishing marks on his body that are mentioned in that Mishnah are non-specific distinguishing marks. For example, that he was tall or he was short. And that is the reason that the distinguishing marks are ineffective in determining his identity so that they could you know, permit her to remarry. The distinguishing marks on his garments mentioned in the Mishnah are ineffective in determining his identity as we are concerned about the possibility of a loan, i.e., well, that was his garment, but he had lent it to someone else. That, that's a movie, right? Somebody lends his jacket to someone else. That person gets killed in a terrible accident. The face is disfigured, but the coat is recognizable, and everyone assumes that that person is dead. And the guy who lent the coat is like, oh my gosh, everybody thinks I'm dead. He could go start his life over somewhere else, right? But it's a valid concern. The fact that the garment was identifiable does not necessarily mean that the person wearing it is that person. Now the Gemara asks, if we are concerned about the possibility that a garment was loaned from one person to another, so then how do we return a donkey to its owner on the basis of distinguishing marks of the saddle, as we said earlier? Perhaps the saddle was borrowed. And the sage is saying in response, people do not typically borrow a saddle because saddles that are not custom fit wound the donkey. Well, that, there, there's something I didn't know before I read that. Donkey saddles have to be custom made or they hurt the donkey. If you wish, say instead, the distinguishing marks on his garments mentioned in the Mishnah are non-specific distinguishing marks. For example, where the witness said that they were white or red, and that is the reason that the distinguishing marks are ineffective in determining his identity. Yeah, there was something they could say specific about the body that the husband had in common, but it's not something that is unique to the husband. Other people have similar markings. <clears throat> The Gemara questions the previous answer with regard to the concern about the possibility of one person lending a garment to another, right? For testimony that a husband died and permitting a woman to remarry. But there is that which is taught in a Baraisa. If the agent found the get that he lost bound to his pouch or his purse or his signet ring, or he found it among his garments, even if he found it a long time after he lost it, the distinguishing marks on those items are sufficient to identify the get as the one that he lost, and it is valid. He can now deliver it to, her, to the wife. And if it enters your mind that we are concerned about the possibility of a loan, meaning that it was lent to someone else, uh, when he found his, the get that he was in, you know, uh, appointed to deliver bound to his pouch, why is it valid? We should be concerned about the possibility of a loan and that perhaps he lent his pouch to someone else and the get that became attached to it is not the get that he was appointed to deliver, but some other get because he lent his pouch to someone else. And the sages say in response, there is no concern in this case. Why? Because people do not loan a pouch, a purse, or a signet ring to another person. <clears throat> Why don't you lend your wallet, right? Your money pouch. Why You don't lend your money pouch to someone else. You might lend somebody money, but do you lend them your money pouch? In other words, do you lend your wallet to someone else? Do you lend your purse to someone else? I mean, maybe a woman who has, you know, a hundred purses might lend one of her purses to a friend, but typically men have a wallet. Uh, and why would they lend their wallet to someone else? I mean, they need their wallet, right? And more than that, one does not loan his pouch and his purse to others due to the fact that it portends the loss of his good fortune. 
And one does not loan his signet ring to others due to the fact that it could be used to forge documents, right? A signet ring is like to make a seal with wax, etc. So the Gemara suggests, let us say, that the dilemma of whether the identification of an item on the basis of distinguishing marks is by Torah law or by rabbinic law is the subject of a dispute between Tanaim, right? Sages of the Mishnaic period. As it is taught in a Baraisa, one does not testify on the basis of a mole on the body of the deceased to determine the identity of a man who died and permit his wife to remarry. And Elazar ben Mahavai says, one testifies to identify the corpse on the basis of a mole. In other words, you can say that, well, you know, because let's say the only witness available is one who saw this dead body and it was a very distinct mole. And he says, I saw that. And so this sage, Elazar ben Mahavai, would allow the woman to be remarried based on that testimony. Uh, but he seems to be in the minority and the majority overruled him. But at least there are two views. And what? Is it not with regard to this matter that they disagree? That the majority holds that identification of an item on the basis of distinguishing marks is by rabbinic law. And therefore, testimony concerning those marks cannot dissolve a marriage by Torah law. And Elazar ben Mahavai holds that identification of an item on the basis of distinguishing marks is by Torah law. And therefore, can be used to dissolve a marriage, which is by Torah law. All marriages are by Torah law. So to dissolve a marriage... You need something that has the strength and authority of Torah law. So Rava said, that is not necessarily the crux of their dispute, as perhaps everyone agrees that identification of an item on the basis of distinguishing marks is by Torah law. And here it is with regard to whether one needs to be concerned that a mole is often found on one's contemporary, i.e. one born under the same constellation rendering it useless as a means of identification that they disagree. In other words, you think that moles are very distinct to people, but you know what? People can have very similar moles. And interesting that they tie markings on our bodies to the arrangement of the stars when we were born. One sage, the first Tana holds that a mole is often found on one's contemporary, other people, and therefore it is insufficient as a means of identification. And the other sage, Elazar ben Mahavai, holds that a mole is not often found on one's contemporary, and therefore it is sufficient as a means of identification. And if you wish, say instead that everyone agrees that a mole is not often found on one's contemporary. And here it is with regard to whether the appearance of distinguishing marks on the body is apt to change after death that they disagree. One sage, the first Tana, holds that appearance of distinguishing marks is apt to change after death. The mole wasn't there when he was alive. It appeared after he died. And that consequently they are insufficient as a means of identification. And the other sage, Elazar ben Mehavai, holds that appearance of distinguishing marks is not apt to change after death. And therefore they are sufficient as a means of identification. Or, if you wish, say instead that everyone agrees that a mole is not apt to change after death and that identification of an item on the basis of distinguishing marks is by rabbinic law. And here it is with regard to whether a mole is a clear-cut distinguishing mark that they disagree. One sage, Elazar ben Mahavai, holds that a mole is a clear-cut distinguishing mark that can be relied upon without hesitation, even in matters of Torah law, for example, dissolving a marriage. And the other sage, meaning the first Tana, holds that mole is a mole is not a clear-cut distinguishing mark since standard distinguishing marks are sufficient by rabbinic law, a marriage, which is in effect by Torah law, cannot be dissolved on the basis of a mole. Standard distinguishing marks are by rabbinic law, not enough to dissolve a marriage, which is by Torah law. Clear and distinct distinguishing marks will satisfy even the Torah law requirement. Rava says, if you say that the identification of an item on the basis of distinguishing marks is not by Torah law, how do we return a lost item to the presumed owner on the basis of distinguishing marks? Perhaps it will result in the return of property to one who was in fact not the owner. And then you didn't fulfill your obligation under Torah law to return the lost object. Rava answers, we return the lost item as it is satisfactory to the finder of a lost item to return it on the basis of distinguishing marks 
rather than exercise his right by Torah law to retain it, so that when an item is lost from him in the future, the finder will return it to him on the basis of distinguishing marks as well. Society agrees that we can return lost objects based on distinguishing marks, uh, even though it's by rabbinic law, it's definitely for the betterment of the community. But the standard that we need to meet for dissolving a marriage obviously should have greater authority. So Rav Safra said to Rav, uh, but can a person perform an act that results in benefit for himself with property that is not his? The lost item belongs not to the finder, but to the one who lost it. How can the finder waive the right of the true owner to the lost item so that he may recover his own lost item in the future? What do you mean uh, that we want to make for the betterment of the community and we all agree? That's not what Torah law is. Torah law, the basis of Torah law is not what we democratically agree should be the law. Torah law is from God and we follow it because God said so. The rabbis may pass ordinances for the betterment of the community, the betterment of mankind, so that we have a fence around the Torah, uh, but they never contradict Torah law. They just help us to follow Torah law. So rather, we return the lost item as it is satisfactory to the owner of the lost item to be able to provide a description using distinguishing marks and on that basis take possession of the item. He knows that he has no witnesses to testify to his ownership and he says no one else knows the clear-cut distinguishing marks that are on the item. And I will provide a description using the clear-cut distinguishing marks and based on that information, I will take possession of the item. Each owner gives his tacit agreement to the return of lost items on the basis of distinguishing marks based on the belief that he is best able to identify them. But isn't that really just another form of for the betterment of the community, we all agree that distinguishing marks is a way to identify lost objects. Is that really by Torah law? I am very close to done. So if you've got questions or comments, please get them in now. The Gemara asks, but there is that which we learned in a Mishnah on page 20a that Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel says, if one found three promissory notes relating to the loan of one debtor who borrowed money from three creditors, he must return the documents to the debtor. If one found three promissory notes relating to the loans of three debtors who borrowed money from one creditor, he must return the documents to the creditor. If one returns lost items on the basis of distinguishing marks due to the tacit agreement of the owners, is it satisfactory to the debtor to have the documents returned to the creditor? As doing so would enable the creditor to collect payment of the loan. And that's where we're going to leave off. Uh, right, we still haven't clearly delineated, we haven't answered the question, is returning lost objects based on uh, the, the, the one who claims to come, comes forward to claim them says, well, the item that I lost has X, Y, and Z distinguishing marks on it, but he doesn't bring witnesses. And based on that, we're going to return the item to him. We do return the item based on distinguishing marks. But do we do so based on rabbinic law or Torah law? We're going to continue that discussion, God willing, tomorrow at the same time this whole week. Right, tomorrow, Wednesday, and again Thursday is going to be at 7 p.m. Pacific, one hour later because of the work that I'm doing all day in the color suite. Although Thursday we're going to be doing dialogue replacement on our movie. Okay, some questions. Bill. So here's a thought I've had about the rules around returning lost items belonging to Gentiles. We've established that, strictly speaking, it's going above and beyond the law, which is praiseworthy, but not required. And there's even a view that it's prohibited. That is not the majority view, but we'll come back to that another time. But supposing a Jew lived, as most Jews throughout history have, in a place that had a mix of Jewish and Gentile residents. And this is why we do return these items. Very good. If in that place they found an item, they'd have no idea if it did or did not belong to a Jew until they proclaimed the fine. Very good. Exempting here Jewish objects like lost to fill in or prayer shawl naturally. So as a practical matter, a Jew would also be required to return a Gentile's item just on the grounds that he wouldn't know it was a Gentile's item until he came to collect. Yes, absolutely. In that case, if you find an item that clearly belonged to a Gentile and didn't belong to a Jew, 
I don't know what that would be, but certainly, you know, you know, if it was somebody's jewelry that 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 showed that they, you know, worship in a different way, uh, then that might that might even without being idolatrous, but it would clearly be something that a Jew doesn't have, right? So he doesn't have the obligation, right? Because it says if you see something that your brother lost, you must return that. Now, for the sake of making Kiddush Hashem, you know, for having peaceful relations, etc., then, then we might say there's an obligation to return, or it might be advisable to return, or it might simply be praiseworthy to return. Uh, on the other hand, there might be the concern that in returning this lost object, uh, you might actually be returning something that would later endanger the Jews, right? So all these things would have to come into consideration uh, and would not be so clear. We have not covered this aspect of the law yet. So I'm not saying what the law is with, return, with regard to returning lost objects uh, that belong to non-Jews. We've only touched peripherally on that. We're definitely not talking about that law in any kind of definitive way yet. All we have seen so far is that the verse itself speaks about returning what is lost by your brother. And in this context, your brother means your fellow Jew. Now, Joe. When a lost item was announced by the finder to the community, how long does the community have to come forward to claim it before the finder could, with confidence, keep it? Fantastic question. I don't know the answer offhand. We are going to come to that question for sure. Uh, and I don't know yet. I don't know yet. I don't remember from the last time I read this uh, years ago. Great question. I'm not sure yet. Sharon. I am fascinated by the phrase, the Gemara rejects this proof. Since the Amoraim, the rabbis of the Gemara, were clearly so diverse, how did a body of such diversity be said to make one statement with apparent uniformity? In other words, how did the halacha get established? I think is what you're asking. Um, so if they kept disagreeing, they kept disagreeing. Now, sometimes they will make a statement like, and the law is. Right. And almost invariably, 99 times out of 100, when the Gemara says, and the law is, that becomes the law. Sometimes not because it says, and the law is, but it was in a context where the law actually wasn't finished. Somebody said that in one environment, but a higher court or an earlier court that was unbeknownst to them or for whatever reason or situation changed, a later sage overruled for with, you know, with very big reason to do so. And the law was established a different way. So, but very often we don't have such, not, not at all do we have a statement like, and the law is, right? They just show the different views uh, and they say, you know, that maybe Rabbah did this and Shmuel did that, right? And they were the authority in their respective cities. So how did the law become established later? And very often it's because Rambam said that based on reading the entire Talmud and all the discussions and that generally we follow the views you know, of, of Rava over Shmuel. Uh, I, I, I'm going to get this wrong, but we follow the views of one sage over another in monetary matters, and we follow that sage in ritual matters, or this was an older sage or a more authoritative sage, or this sage's views were undermined later, etc. Based on that totality uh, of, of these discussions over centuries, Somebody like Rambam, right, Maimonides, will come along much later, right? M Rambam was 12th century, uh, and he will say, and the law is, right? Based on the totality of the Talmud and all the historical precedents and the custom that emerged of what J J most Jewish communities were doing, that eventually it became codified as the halacha. And it's so important to understand that the Talmud records so many different views, just as Sharon is saying, that there are diverse viewpoints and that they keep arguing with each other and rejecting proofs, right? Somebody offered a proof and somebody said, no, that's not a convincing proof. So how do we know what law to follow? And that's how we say we don't pask in halacha from the Gemara, right? Just because we read a law that seemed definitive in a page of Talmud, that doesn't mean that that's where Jewish law ended up. And that's why we check a codification of Jewish law like Shulchan Aruch to understand, well, what exactly is the law that we follow, right? And now there's very few things. There, there are some, but very few where there's, you know, multiple views and people hold different ways. There are customs where people go different, right? Sephardim 
will eat rice and kidneyot during uh, Passover, and Ashkenazim don't. So that's a very big difference in the Jewish world, but it's not, you know, that, that comes from custom that eventually hardened and became the halacha in those communities. But it's actually very few of those kinds of things. Mostly it's different customs, uh, but we agree on 99.999% of what is halacha, right? And it came as a result of this process. Uh, Sharon also says it is important to recognize that a garment biblically is not just clothes. It typically served as a blanket, protection, and covering. Very good. There is a midrash that says that Pharaoh's daughter recognized Moses as a Jewish baby based on the fabric he was swaddled in. So perhaps even the weaving method itself was unique. I mean, also that at a time when all Jewish babies were commanded to be drowned in the river, and here comes a baby floating in the river. Uh, but that wouldn't be enough to be sure, right? And that's why Sharon says that there's this tradition, this midrash that says, and it was swaddled in clothes that clearly identified it as a Jew. Exactly. People did not have hundreds of garments like we do. You know, they were lucky if they had two or three. Many people just had one garment. They lived in that. They lived in that. And that's why it says in another place that if somebody borrows money, from you and you're going to take his garment as a pledge right that you have to give it back to him when he needs to wear it you can't use that as the collateral uh, because you're not going to make him walk around naked or if it's his overcoat but he needs it to sleep at night and be warm you can't keep it overnight sharon also says read a really cool teaching brought up by oh, my good friend Josh Warshawski about how each face is the unique image of God because of the letter Aleph. The two eyes are shaped like the two Yuds. An Aleph is made of two Yuds and above. Um, so it says that the eyes are shaped like the two Yuds and the nose is like above and an Aleph is made from two Yuds and above. And this represents God because two Yuds and above are numerically equivalent to the tetragrammaton. In other words, the numerical value of God's name, yud ke vav ke is 26, and the numerical value of the components of an aleph, yud, yud, and vav, are also 26. And therefore, you, which, which, what Josh is saying, and you know, Sharon is giving it to us in the name of Josh, is that when you look into another person's face, you're looking at God, as it were. And if you're going to respect, fear, and love God, then you have to apply that respect, love, and fear in the face of the humans that you encounter. Uh, and that Aleph is the first letter of the, of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God begins with Aleph. That's what I've got for us today. Uh, and Thank you, Sharon. That's excellent. And thank you, everybody. And with God's help, we'll be together again tomorrow uh, at this one hour later time that we're doing this week. 7 p.m. Pacific, when God willing, we'll continue with page 28 and our investigation of is returning an object according to distinguishing marks by Torah law.